on today's Apple Daily. What if Apple did make a monitor? Missing Scott Forstall. Apple's M1 SSD wear problem. Why the dislikes? AirPods Pro 2 expectations and antivirus for Mac. For the latest Apple news, rumors and leaks, every weekday at 12 UTC, join us in the iCave. I'm iCave Dave and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you. And if you want the latest Apple leaks, news and rumors every weekday at 12 UTC, like this video, subscribe to the channel and ring the bell so that you don't miss a thing. And if you want a shout out in a future video, hashtag notification squad down in the comments so that I know that you are in my notification squad. Let's get into it. What if Apple did make a monitor? This is gonna be a dream monitor kind of thing. This is gonna be some of the features that I think that Apple could bring to a new style of monitor, which I don't see anyone has kind of mentioned yet. Everyone at the moment just seems to be going, yeah, they should make a screen. It should be cheaper. Cool. Now that seems kind of dull and not particularly Apple-y. Apple tends to do stuff when they can do something that's cool and interesting and does something that other people's stuff doesn't do as well. So here are some features that I think Apple should introduce in their own branded monitor. Number one, one of the biggest complaints that everyone has with the M1 Max right now is they don't have enough ports. So why waste one of them on using an external display? Apple already has the technology for air playing up to 4K content. So why not use it for displays? I know it's not gonna be as efficient, but for the vast majority of people in a lot of situations, it might not be too bad actually. And Wi-Fi is certainly fast enough to uh, send 4K over Wi-Fi, especially over Wi-Fi Direct. So you could have a U1 chip in your M1 Mac and a U1 chip in your display. And as soon as you put your Mac down in front of the display, it could pop up on the screen and say, do you want to connect to your display? You hit yes and boom, there you go. You have got an AirPlayed low latency wireless monitor. Number two, it is awake as fast as a MacBook. One of the big marquee features of the new M1 MacBooks is how quickly they wake from sleep. And as soon as you open that display, before it's anywhere near open, uh, you have got your display active and you've got Craig Federici poking his little face in there to see if it's on yet. So that's one of the things that I found with using the Mac Mini is that you don't get that because the TVs are not quick enough to react. But Apple could make their own display that is just as quick as powering on your MacBook. As soon as you hit a key, poof, it's there. Number three, build in Apple TV functionality. Now it completely makes sense that if we're gonna have something that is a big old display, that's gonna probably have the nicest looking display that you have in your house, even if it's not quite the biggest, that it should have Apple TV functionality built right in. So uh, whether that's something that you have as essentially another source on your display, or it works in a different way to that. I don't know, let me use tvOS on it so that when I finish with my computer in the evening or it can be a standalone display on your desk if it's gonna be for expanding your laptop, that makes a lot of sense that you can use it for displaying images or you know, as a media center, something like that. Number four, Face ID and a 4K webcam. We all know that everyone hates the, the webcams in pretty much every Mac. MacBooks certainly, iMacs, they've got better in the last generation, but they're still only at 1080p. We have 4K webcams built into our iPhones. There's no reason that we couldn't have those in the displays. So let's throw it into the Apple monitor, the Apple display, whatever they're gonna call it. It's probably gonna just be called Apple display. So let's throw in Face ID and a 4K webcam uh, that you can use with whatever you happen to be attaching it to. Number five, Pro speakers and mic. Exactly the same way that we have it on the MacBook Pros right now. We have some really good mics and really, really good speakers, especially in the 16 inch MacBook Pro, which I'm assuming will be coming to the new designs as well. A big old display with really great speakers and a really good microphone so that you don't necessarily need to use anything external like this thing which by the way, I'm not using at the moment, that's uh, purely for uh, when I used to do podcasting, but give us really good mics so that we don't need to worry about all the other stuff. Make sense? Cool, thanks so much. And as a little bonus, something that Apple should definitely add to all of their Macs that exist already is being able to let us scale our displays by physical size as well as pixel uh, dimensions. So right now I have two displays over here which are exactly the same size in the real world they are both 40 inch displays, but this bottom one is 4K, this top one is 1080p, which means that Apple sees this bottom display as being four times as big as this one. Uh, so when I go into system preferences, I have a little tiny display sitting on top of this big display at the bottom, uh, which is confusing because it means if I kind of scroll my mouse up at the sides, 
it, it stops and if I scroll up in the middle then it goes on to the upper display. Now I know most people don't use displays one above the other, most people go side to side, that makes far more sense for most people, but that's what I do and it would be really helpful if I could just scroll across. It would also be nice if it kept your windows kind of the same size when you move them between, but I know that that means they'd just be really scaled down on that one. And so I'm not worried about that so much, but just let me uh, kind of move my mouse between the displays quite seamlessly. It's a bit tricky right now. Has anyone seen Scott Forstall? Skewmorphism fan Scott Forstall appears to be AWOL and Epic Games are after him to testify at their court date with Apple, which will presumably be accompanied by a Fortnite update where everyone is in attorney costumes. Forstall was one of the champions of the original iPhone look, so if you miss your old school leather bound iPhone calendar pages and note paper in notes, perhaps you should help join the search party instead of just sitting there staring at YouTube. Now, Apple has been able to provide his Twitter handle and a PO box address so that they don't have a current phone number for Scott, but if they did, their privacy policy would prevent them from sharing that anyway. It is good to know that Apple is just as committed to the privacy of its ex-employees in court cases as it is against Facebook. That all being said, Forstall didn't leave Apple in a particularly orderly way, reportedly being forced out after a botched launch of Apple Maps, which I think everyone's forgotten about now, but believe it or not, it wasn't that well received on day one. Following Scott's departure, Johnny Ive expanded his role from product design to include the new user interface on iPhone and iPad, deleting the skeuomorphic design and bringing the flatter aesthetic that we have the evolution of today. Right now, we know that Tim Cook and Hair Force One Craig Federici will appear at the court, though Epic wants to call Scott for his part of the launch of the original App Store on the iPhone. Apple's M1 SSD wear problem. Will it shorten M1's life? Now, there's been a lot of talk over the past few days as well as questions about this since they were released, whether the SSD or the solid state drives inside Apple's M1 computers is going to be worn out by the use of swap files as a result of the lower unified memory in M1 systems. Because Apple's M1 systems have such fast SSDs which can access the data at around 3.4 gigabytes per second, the lower memory configuration seem to act like more memory than there is as it uses some of the SSD to swap data to and from. The reason for the concern is that flash memory has a lifespan expressed as a TBW or total bytes writable. This number gives a warranty for how much data can be written to the drive before the chance of failure increases as the individual cells that hold data take a small amount of damage each time they're rewritten. With Samsung's drives being able to be filled around 600 times before the likelihood of a failure increases. Now that's actually a lot of data, especially when you remember that your OS data is pretty static and any long-term storage on your device like application files and photo libraries are fairly static too. Reading data doesn't damage the disk at all, only rewriting it and reprogramming the cells. So using a swap file will reduce the life of the drive, but most likely not to the point where a failing SSD is likely to limit the useful life of the machine at all. The M1 is, despite its high performance, designed to be an entry-level machine for those doing lighter work on their machines, and even the smallest configured versions under fairly typical use shouldn't hit these TBWs within five or more years. Now, there are those who have been testing uh, this using a tool called Smart Monitoring Tools, which report that 1-2% to of their drive's lifespan has been used up already. Again, this is when the drive hits 100% here. That doesn't mean it will fail immediately. That just means that the warranted number of writes has been hit. Assuming the tool knows what the warranted number is, which it doesn't, it's an assumed number based on a typical drive. However, Apple uses Toshiba TLC NAND flash drives in their M1 Max, which are rated for a complete drive write per day which at that level of usage, which would be extremely high, wouldn't hit their TBW for more than eight years of full daily drive writes. Bear in mind that Apple has been using NAND flash in their iPhones, iPads and Macs for many years, and I don't know of anyone, not a single person that has had an Apple SSD fail. Now, I'm sure there are some, but I don't know any of them, and I've not even seen reports of it online, so I think we can fairly safely assume that they are pretty rare and Apple, just like everyone else, has been using swap files for decades. 
Apple also bought Anobit, a company that specializes in designing controllers that increase NAND endurance in 2012, along with their 65 patents, as they were the makers of the flash in the first iPhones. Bear in mind as well that anyone that's running tests that involve using terminal to check their drives are probably very much power users who are probably using their drives a lot more because they're running constant benchmarks and they're running a lot of tests that will um, really stress the drives, they'll be doing read-write speed tests all the time, so they're not the typical user. That is another important thing to remember with these. So, is this a scandal? No, I don't think it is, and there's no evidence to suggest at this stage that it is. But what could be a great move for Apple would be to create a tool just like their iPhone battery health tool that can show you the status of your internal storage, identify any issues as soon as they begin to occur and hopefully notify you in time to create backups or migrate your data before a failure happens. Peace of mind is absolutely priceless. There could even be a system where Apple allocates an amount of temporary iCloud storage where it will evacuate your drive if there is an issue. That would be a pretty magical solution. Now Constant Geekery has got a great video up from a couple of weeks ago on the topic of SSD drive where even with his more conservative numbers, five years of life should be extremely comfortable for these before hitting the TWB. Now you can check it out just up here and I'll also leave a link in the description. And we'll get into some iCave answers. First of all, Dwayne Alfred, hashtag iCave answers. I really wanna know who the two people are that keep disliking all of your videos. Your content is so good and straightforward. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you saying that. Now, I don't know who it is that's disliking them. It, really doesn't matter to me it's not a big deal because these dislikes are coming before the video is even going live so it's when it's sitting there as a premiere so there's either a couple of people that are always disappointed because they always arrive too early realize the video is not there yet and get really sad um, so that's a possibility but i think more likely is it somebody that has decided they don't like me maybe i was sarcastic about their mother um, and uh, has decided to just come and dislike my videos before they go up. It's just one of those things that happens. Those likes and dislikes are basically there to let me know whether the, comment, uh, the content's any good and when they're there before we even start, I know it's not a reflection of the content. But if you wanna help me out and get that ratio up, hit the like button right now. Next, Savik Murkaji asks, what new features would we expect to get with the AirPods Pro 2 coming next month or so? Being an AirPods Pro user, I love what Apple is doing with computational audio. It's only going to get better. So on this one, there are very few leaks on what might actually be coming with the new AirPods Pro other than the new design style. Because there's very little in terms of the leaks, I would say that the most likely things are the redesign. This is a pretty safe bet if they are redesigning them. Let's, uh, let's give me a pass on the back for that one. Apple Track, I hope you're watching. But beyond that, I think... Uh, some of the stuff that we've heard about in the past, not particularly recently with these AirPods Pro, is that Apple is looking to do computational um, audio. So they're doing their spatial audio already, but they're also looking at bringing some health features to AirPods. So the Pros would be a good place to start with this, and maybe they're gonna get in-ear temperature sensors would be a really good one to do, because in a hospital, in your ear is quite often the place that will take your temperature. Uh, the other thing that can easily be done in there is heart rate monitoring. So if for some reason you are not an Apple Watch user and you just want to run with your phone in your back pocket and your AirPods in, this could be a way to monitor your heart rate throughout your run. Your iPhone will be able to do the accelerometer stuff and count your steps and also uh, use the GPS data. So if for some reason you've got AirPods Pro and you've got an iPhone but you haven't decided to buy yourself an Apple Watch, that could be another advantage of it. And UK Apple Sheep. Sorry I missed the premiere. You're dead to me, but let's move on. iCave answers. In my, in my opinion, antivirus software is not needed on Mac. As long as you don't give administrator access to the locked preferences, the system code makes it almost impossible for you to install malware without needing loads of passwords and warnings. What's your opinion on this? Well, put it this way, I don't have anything antivirus-y kind of installed on my stuff. I do use a bit of Malwarebytes, and I think we mentioned this yesterday. Uh, Malwarebytes is one of these things that is worth kind of downloading and having in your pocket so that every so often, if your system is playing up a little bit, you've got it ready, you can just hit that uh, quick scan button and it tends to pick pretty much everything up. We were talking about Silver Sparrow yesterday and the day before. 
Uh, Malwarebytes apparently does pick it up, so that's very useful, although it has left some people with Chrome not being able to open sites properly. So it might be that you need to run Malwarebytes and then reinstall anything that's not working properly and then run it again just to be on the safe side. Um, but in general, as a kind of background process thing, the way that Apple does their security tends to be based on the stuff that we were talking about yesterday with security uh, certificates and trusted developers and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, in general, you don't need it. Most people don't run antivirus on Macs in the same way that they would with Windows. Although I actually think Windows has probably got a lot closer to not needing it these days as well. It's not like it used to be most of the stuff that comes into your system is not going to be kind of caught by antivirus because it tends not to be viruses it tends to be trojans and it tends to be worms and things like that that uh, can get away from those things anyway but um, if you want peace of mind and you think that it's something that will help you i mean go for it but i wouldn't spend any money on it and uh, be aware that there will be probably a performance penalty because uh, you need to allocate some system resources to that running so notification squad i mentioned how to join it at the beginning of the show subscribe to the channel ring the bell and uh notification squad down in the comments um our new member today daniel saldina thank you so much for joining us and that's it for today's show guys thank you so much for watching this is uh, another great show we had some great questions uh please write in with your questions hashtag ikave answers i love answering them so you might as well ask them see you in the next one